Kia ora koutou, tālo falawa. Welcome to this Te Pūtiaki Manatanga Association of Educators Beyond the Classroom webinar, number 20 in our series. Ko Helen Lloyd Tukuinga, I'm one of the learning specialists for Te Pūtiaki Manatanga, and today our topic is accessible programs for the visually impaired. So um, as usual, we'll be recording this session and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel and our website for those who are unable to make the um, live event today. And I know that we're expecting maybe relatively a, um, a small um, audience, live audience today, because we have actually already just had another webinar earlier this afternoon about Matarekis, which um, some of you might have seen. Um, and so if you've got any questions for our speakers, please pop them in the chat and we'll attend to the questions at the end of the presentations. Um, so as usual, we'll start with the karakia and then I'll welcome and introduce our presenters for today. The karakia. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina ki uta, ki a mā tara tara ki tai, e hi aki ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hohu, ti he mauriora. Well, welcome everybody. It's wonderful to have our speakers um, today. I'm really excited about this topic and I know that it's something that lots of you have asked us to um, cover and that you're interested in learning more about. Um, so we've got um, four speakers today. So I'll start with um, the images you can see on the screen to the left. We have Mary Fisher. Mary is a retired double gold medalist and record-breaking Paralympian swimmer, and she has a strong disability advocate for the blind and low vision community. She will share what's made a difference for her personally, um, both as an adult and when she was a child visiting culture and heritage spaces, and she'll share some of her advice um, as a dis disability advocate. Next up, we have Tracy Miller and Lee Fraser who are resource teachers of the Blind and Low Vision Education Network in New Zealand. Tracy and Lee's role is to support learners who are blind or who have low vision so that they can gain access to their learning. Today, Tracy and Lee have um, created two pre-recorded presentations for us. That, and through those presentations, they will give you ideas about how to both understand the spectrum of low vision and blindness, and also how you can support learners in, in our settings beyond the classroom. Finally, we have Judith Jones. So Judith is a T -T -T Papa visitor host and tour guide and also an audio describer, both at Te Papa and elsewhere for live performances. She was part of our first sensory art tour pilot in 2015, and she's created sensory tours throughout the museum. She's also a member of the Arts for Wellington um, Network, Arts for All Wellington Network. Today, Judith will share some of what she's learned through um, sharing sensory tours and the feedback she's had from audiences and her research into how audio description and touch can support a meaningful experience. So I'm very excited to hear from everybody. Um, and to, we're going to be starting with uh, Tracy, is, Tracy, isn't it? Tracy and Lee. Is that right? Over to you, Tracy and Lee. Hi, I'm Tracy and I'm an RTV with Blends. Um, we're based here in Wellington. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, I'm Tracy's offsider, Lee, and yep, we're really happy to be presenting and walking alongside you today. Kia ora. You may find yourself presenting a program to a learner who has low vision or is blind. This overview is about Blends, the resource teacher for vision and how vision impacts access to learning. As possible, your learner will be on our Blends school role, so they could be well familiar with some of the strategies we suggest to you today. There's a saying, a hakoa he iti hibunamu. Although it is small, it is a treasure. 
And although some ideas we'll share may seem simple or small, they can make a big difference to your learners. Who are we? And why might we have some helpful information to share with you? BLEMS is the acronym of our school title. We're a national school comprising a main campus in Auckland and 15 visual resource centres across New Zealand, filled with enthusiastic and productive resource teachers. We're itinerant teachers, which means we visit learners, or ākonga, in their usual place of learning. To be on our BLEMS role, ākonga, will have a significant eye condition and we advise the teaching team on ways to provide great access despite reduced or no vision. The recommendations we offer support inclusive learning, learning alongside peers and visibly reflect the UDL for framework. First, let's look a little at vision and how it can impact access to learning. Wearing glasses is not an indicator as to whether someone needs vision support. Glasses usually fully correct someone's vision so they can see perfectly. But in the case of BLEMS students, glasses do not fully correct. For some eye conditions, glasses do not help at all and many of our students don't wear glasses. So vision loss is not immediately an obvious thing. It is something you'll need to inquire about beforehand. These pictures show different levels of acuity or clarity of vision. As you can see, the less clarity a person has, the less detail they can see. Reduced acuity makes it difficult to see facial expressions, which is why being up the front or close to the learning helps, and being provided verbal descriptions of what's being visually referred to also really helps. Other than reduced clarity, the eye condition itself can also offer challenges. Some eye conditions make the central vision blurry. It can mean a specific print size is needed and a head tilt is used. Some eye conditions mean a person can't see information to one side. This impacts on what side of the presentation they should be seated. And some eye conditions mean glare makes it harder to see. Sunglasses and hats help, as does lighting. A learner might see better with lights on or off, with blinds up or down. Conservative estimates say 75% of learning naturally comes through using vision. Some experts put the figure closer to 95% and much learning is gained incidentally through vision. This drawing illustrates this. How might you help a child who is blind get a great understanding of what an elephant is? It takes explicit teaching of concepts. We can support access to learning through the teaching strategies we use, adaptions we make to resources, and by using tools and we'll share these ideas in our next presentation. As you can see, it'll help to know if there is a learner who is blind or has low vision attending your program so that you can plan ahead. Consider how your organisation might go out about finding this out. If you are providing a service to a school group, perhaps there's a resource teacher of vision who already supports the learner and can offer some advice. And maybe there is already an information sheet that the school holds about how the learner uses their vision in daily activities that you can refer to. And so, a hakoahe ipi hipunamu. Even the smallest adjustments can make a great difference to the inclusion and participation of a learner who is vision impaired. Kia ora. Thank you both for that introduction. Um, and now I'm going to hand over to Mary. Kia ora tato, um, no ingarangi o kutupuna, and ko Nati Pakia te iwi, e fano mai o e te awa kairangi, ko pōniki aho i noho ana, ko Mary Fisher tōku ingoa. Um, thanks very much for joining this live or recorded presentation. Um, it's really wonderful that yeah, like national organizations are thinking specifically about 
how going forward we can cater to everyone, especially young people or people visiting places like museums who have vision loss. Um, it's lovely to be here. I'll talk a little bit about some of my personal experiences as someone with vision impairment and also a little bit about language, which maybe I'll cover off first. Um, so I think the thing about um, language is that it changes a lot and what person A feels really comfortable with, person B might not necessarily identify with, even if they have the same like medical eye condition type of thing. Um, so I think that is important to remember. But generally at the moment in Aotearoa, New Zealand, best practice is to say vision impairment is this umbrella term that covers anyone who with the best prescription or like best correction um, can't see what a normal human eye is expected to see. Um, and so that might be because of a genetic condition or an accident or an age related eye condition or something happening in someone's brain that affects how they perceive the world visually. Um, yeah, and so there's that kind of umbrella term of vision impairment, which medically gets split into blind, low vision, and people who also have a hearing loss, as well as being blind or low vision, are called deaf blind. Um, so those are the three main categories that we'll talk about at the moment. Um, see if that changes in the future, but in 2022, um, we tend to use vision impairment and um, blind and low vision. And it's not a derogatory term, it's just a labeling um, factor, like other things of like, I have wavy hair or I like manatees, I'm also blind. Um, yeah, and for me, my vision loss is through an eye condition that I was born with. No one else in my family has it. Um, my parents just thought I was not doing things the same as other kids in their antenatal class and so um, I at six weeks old they were told oh we're not really sure what Mary will be able to see but she will have low vision and that might change over the course of her life. So growing up as a primary school kid um, I had low acuity and would in the picture that was just shown it would have the representation of the world that I had would have been like the legally blind kind of um, yeah, depiction of what a regular scene might look like. But that was all that I knew. So I had no like perfect vision to compare my reality to. Um, I just found it really hard to see details and, and facial expressions. So I was pretty good at working on people's body language if I was close enough and could see bright colors, um, but found it really difficult when we went to, you know, like the observatory as school kids and upper hut coming into Wellington and all excited for EOTC and then I could not at all see the little red pointer and felt quite left out of some activities but at the same time didn't want to be different from my sighted classmates who were all like oh oh that constellation oh that's really interesting and me not wanting to point out that I needed extra help um, and so yeah it's a tricky balance of wanting all the kids I think personally, wanting every child or person visiting a museum or a similar place to have access to all the information that they want and that other people can access, but it might be tricky for them. So I think if I was a kid at, in that situation, my ideal scenario would be maybe I could have been given some large print constellations to look at and when the the um, staff person at the observatory had been pointing the pointer up to the ceiling a few meters away that I couldn't see um, that maybe another kid or a staff member kind of like a buddy system could have pointed out some of the things that were being described in really descriptive detail directional language that that would that would have been more of an ultimate than me just like shrinking away and feeling like astronomy is never going to be for me or these types of things that I think people with all kinds of disabilities can feel a bit left, left out from if like physically you can't access a space or the information isn't isn't great um, for your access needs. Um, yeah and for me as a teenager my vision got a lot worse so I can still see light and dark but I can't like see colours and I learned to read braille and use a white cane um, so 
for some of those factors like getting around a new place by myself is quite difficult and I think later on today we'll have a quick talk about kind of mapping a new space and how an unfamiliar environment can feel quite daunting and energy sapping um, so yeah going with a group of people who understand about your needs or uh, teachers or resource teachers vision and then the staff doing a little bit of work beforehand to understand the needs of all the students I think is like exceptionally valuable um, so I know later on Judith is going to talk about a few items that can be used to enhance the experience and also I have been on the receiving end of Judith's wonderful audio description which if you haven't heard of before no worries that's fine um, but a really cool way of being able to describe visual elements in a way that yeah allows a person with a vision impairment to um, yeah to experience them in whatever scaffolding they currently have in, in their brain if they can't see it at all or can't see it clearly uh, which is often the case with things in these you know things have to be behind glass or in certain protective places or they're just too big and um, yeah for longevity we can't have them being touched or moved around um, yeah so I kind of just want to finish up by saying thank you for attending and thinking about um, this topic which you know makes the experience of not just the child or adult with a vision impairment um, experiencing a new place uh, more valuable but also the people they're with um, and that's yeah that's really special to people cool I'll pass back to him thank you Mary that was a really wonderful insight thank you um, and if anyone's got any questions directly for Mary um, please put them in the chat and we'll come back at the end now I'm going to hand back over to Tracy and Lee again Kia ora. This presentation shares ways to make your program, its demonstrations and resources, accessible to the learner who is blind or has low vision. These will enable the learner to engage and participate in the educational program alongside peers. The following slides share ways that improve viewing and access. A point to note is that Everybody benefits from these adaptions and modifications, not just the person with low vision. Everyone benefits when we can see more easily and clearly. Before we look at strategies, we'd like to call your attention to the environment. Often unfamiliar to the learner, it's important to consider how they will manage to safely find their way around. As part of your planning, find out how the learner usually travels with a cane, in a wheelchair, or perhaps it'll just be helpful to be buddied up with a peer or adult. The learner may like to be guided in the unfamiliar environment, something that's helpful in car parks and crowds too. In front of you are guidelines to being a sighted guide. As you move, they'll feel you move downwards or upwards. They'll feel you turn to the left or right. Also assess your environment, what might be done or altered so they can move confidently and safely. Look for areas that could be hard to navigate, especially check steps. Are they well marked? If not, they can look like a ramp to a person with low vision. So is there a ramp to use instead? Can you change the travel route to avoid drop-offs or obstacles? And can you go around crowded areas instead of through them? Could guides or leaders wear bright vests so that they are easy to locate in a crowd? Sometimes using cones can help mark boundaries or create a pathway to follow. Sensory maps that help with orientation are another way to show the environment. There are teaching strategies we can use to enable better access to the visuals of learning. Consider glare and lighting, for example. Glare makes it very challenging for the learner to use the vision that they do have. The educator or presenter should place themselves so their back is not to the sun. 
it's difficult to look into the light and see facial expressions, resources and demonstrations. However, when seating the learner, it's the opposite. Do seat them with their back to the window to stop them looking into the light. Other strategies to consider include placement. Where would the best place to see the demonstrations and displays be to get the most detail? Usually that would be up close or at the front. Offer them the best place to view for each activity. Much information is gained incidentally through vision. So in the absence of vision, look for other ways to show concepts. Can you provide real objects or representations of concepts to hold and explore? What other senses can you tap into? Smell, hearing, touch? And use specific language to fill in the gaps of vision. Verbalise your demonstrations. Use a learner's name when their hand is up. Say, yes, Joe, or Joe, I see your hand is up. It confirms to them that they've been seen and that it's their turn to speak. Instead of saying the pens are on that desk, say the pens are on the red desk. Scanning and searching for things with low vision quickly becomes visually tiring. Universal design for learning means that while the learner gets the same information as their peers, it may look different in how it's presented. You can improve access and engagement by designing resources or adapting them so that they're easier to see. For the learner with low vision, consider these three things, contrast, size and clutter. We want to create contrast so the work stands out. Blue or black pens offer the best contrast. Red or green pens are more difficult to see. Consider this when writing on a whiteboard. Consider having white trays to place materials onto. The orange dough is easier to see when on a contrasting white background, like in this picture. Find out the print size they require to read. You might enlarge using a photocopier. If you have the digital copy, change the print size before printing or perhaps scan material into an iPad so it can be pinch zoomed into the size they need. Navigating a busy document is hard work on the eyes. Can you simplify it and remove the clutter? The adapted version of Waterworld is accessible. It has only the important information. The font has been standardized into Arial. The print size enlarged and density has been increased for contrast. This slide itself is getting a bit cluttered. Tools to have on hand might be Vivids, Black Biros and 4B pencils that make a dark line, but here are three other things to consider. If they're a Braille learner, you'll need to take the cue from them or an adult on how best to present resources. If they read using a Braille tool, they might be able to read a Word document that you can email to them beforehand. They may be able to access your work online if you share links. Or perhaps they will just enjoy having someone read the information to them in this instance. Learners often have assistive technology that they can bring. Find out what they use. iPads are common. Have your Wi-Fi code ready for them to connect on arrival. And iPads are handy to have on hand no matter what. If there are items on display, could you have a photo on the iPad ready to be viewed up close? Or even a handheld magnifier is helpful and something that everyone finds fun to use. Thank you for joining us to look at ways we can make learning accessible to our learners. Small things we thoughtfully do can make a big difference. As mentioned, it would be helpful if you knew ahead of time if a learner attending your program had vision needs. If they do, and it's a school group, you may find they have a teacher aid or a resource teacher vision who can assist on the day or provide you with information on how to support the learner's vision. Thanks for further filling your teaching kite with us today. Nō reira, tēnā koe, e hoa mahi. Thank you so much, um, Tracy and Lee. That was such a clear presentation full of so many useful tips and tricks that we can all put into practice. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Judith. Kia ora. 
I work here at Te Papa. I'm a tour guide and I work in public programs. I'm not wearing my uniform today, just wearing ordinary old clothes. I'm going to tell you a little bit about sensory tours and the kind of things that I've learned from creating those here at Te Papa. Um, I came to this ally space as an audio describer. So I trained in audio description in 2014 and very excited. Audio description is about using words, as Mary said, to, to give people a, a richer experience that's really meaningful for them. I was already good to go. We had this wonderful pilot where we brought together our curators, our conservators, um, people from public programs and people with a blind and low vision community to put together a tour that would be really valuable and interesting with lots of sensory elements. We um, stood in front of the first work and I had worked hard to think of ways that might be relevant to people to think about measurements. And I stood up and talked about this particular artwork as being as large as a bath towel. And straight away, someone said to me, how big is that in measurements? I didn't have a clue. The measurement is, doesn't work for me. But boy, did I learn fast that you need to be really listening to your community. And I've, I've never, never forgotten those. Luckily, they were on the label nearby. We usually add for those tours in a social time. So we're in a way of of finding feedback, I guess, in a in a more social kind of environment. So because our tours are very small and there's only maybe six or seven people, you don't want to stand in front of them and say, how do we do? So finding out what people wanted to know more about and understanding has taught me a lot. So it's it's very much about the impact and not your intention. You may have an intention to do a to, to create something in a certain way, but it really has to work. Audio description is a very key part of the tours that we do and it's a spoken language describing visual images or objects so the audience can engage and pursue their own journey with whatever you're describing and my approach to this has really changed over time pure audio description says just say what you see but what i hear from people is they're interested in not not just what something looks like but what it does what its vibe is is what somebody said or back to that idea of impact. Why are you telling about us about this? What is it that, that we're, we're finding out here? Share in a different way. So I'm also aware that audio description and sensory tours support universal design. Research from Vocalize in the UK on the behavior of sighted museum visitors suggests that having vision might not necessarily equate to having complete access to a museum. And there's some research that they've done, which Monica's very helpfully just put up, it will be able to audio description an inclusive museum and it really mirrors my experience when I'm taking a tour when we've got I'm standing up and doing an audio description or we've got things to touch and people gravitate around us they want that multi-sensory idea research certainly suggests that we should start they say in the in the um, research to think about audio description differently it's remit is access and it should be a priority but if audio description can help more museum visitors to engage and increase the impact of the museum visit, time for museums and curators to start thinking about it as a tool for inclusive interpretation. So what does it sound like? I'm going to read you an audio description right now, and it's for a tour that um, Mary's coming on next week here at Te Papa in, in our nature area. We're in front of a wall with two horizontal shelves with 25 deep sea creature specimens they're all preserved in a clear liquid and glass jars. The biggest are five litres and the smallest are three, 375 millilitres. They're lit with a golden light. A large magnifying glass can move up and down and along the rows. And there's a screen to the right with a photo of each specimen which can be enlarged. I'm going to talk about a fierce little fish in a 375 millilitre jar, about the size of a small peanut butter jar. It's third from the right at the top. It's an adult fang tooth. Its scientific name is Anoplogaster cornuta. Reading that out, not sure of the pronunciation. It's a small, wide, flat fish, nose down in the jar with its belly to our left. It's about 15 centimetres long, about an unused pencil, and its body takes up almost the width of the jar. It's black, but here light from behind sends a golden glow across its skin. It has small prickly scales, a line of larger backward facing prickles down its spine and two clusters of sharp points underneath. Its small tail, almost hidden up under the white lid of the jar, is divided in two and ends rather shaggily with still more prickly spikes. 
The fangtooth has a large mouth which opens angled back across its body. The fangtooth mouth is full of needle-thin, sharp pointed teeth, including huge front fangs that spear out of the top and bottom jaws. Compared to the size of its body, it has the biggest teeth of any animal living on the, in the ocean. Māori have no name for this fish. It lives deep in the ocean and is only harvested by deep water trawlers, so perhaps they didn't encounter it or the name was lost. The te reo name given here is Nehore, which translates into English as canine or eye tooth. Our specimen has its mouth partly open. Its teeth are so long and angled that it just can't close its mouth like we can. The bottom fangs slide into skin flaps like pockets in the top jaw, so it doesn't spike itself and puncture its brain. This fish is black, ultra black. Fangfish is some of the blackest of all creatures. When things are as dark as they are in the deep ocean, if you as fish reflect even a tiny bit of light, something else can detect you. And that might be what you're trying to hunt and eat. It might be something that's trying to hunt and eat you. The fangfish's skin absorbs light instead of reflecting it. The ultra black skin basically sucks up all the light. So the fish matches the pitch blackness of the deep sea. Scientists are trying to work out how to do something similar to create material that reflects as little as possible, for example, for ultra camouflage. So we'll talk a bit about touch. I've learned over time that touch is not the magic wand that I might have imagined. I took a tour with um, someone from overseas who was blind and at the end of the tour he said to me how important it was and how he repeated that I had noted that people don't necessarily understand exactly everything if you just give it to them to touch. He said there's that story that you know you see in the movies that someone is blind will come up to you and run their hands over your face and tell you how beautiful you feel and it's really not like that at all. It's really important that you you choose your touch objects with care. They have to be relevant, they have to be adding value to the overall story and you need to give people time to explore the objects. Sitting down really helps if people are holding something. So I've got a bunch of bits and pieces I'm going to be leaping up and down to show you some of our touch objects. You can use the object itself if that's at all possible, or you can use a model. So I've got some bits that are models that were, this is a model of the Haast Eagle head, um, not completed body, but our model maker, Jake here at Te Papa, gave me this, it was something he used along the way, but it means that people get a sense of that extraordinarily solid beak that those birds use when they're dropping down like, hurricanes down on top of the, the giant moor. You can use a model alongside something that's that's similar. So for example, here is an actual claw of a harrier. It has, I'm going to hold it a higher. Higher. Um, it has claws, it has some skin to feel, and it has just a little bit of feathers at the top as well. But alongside it then you can say, but this is the claw of the hust eagle. This is Poaka's huge claws. So you've given people a sense of the physicality of it. This is a kind of plasticky model. It's not the same at all, but you bring the two together and people start to get a sense of what that creature must be like. Everybody would enjoy that kind of additional aspect, as they say. You can also use component parts. So again, for that particular eagle, our model maker found that the feathers that he was using were not wide enough to give the bird a sense of the lift that it would need to get itself back off the ground once it had started, once it had landed. So he put two together. So there's a splice just down where I'm pointing here. It's a per perfect example of how if you just gave that to somebody, anybody, it's not an easy thing to understand exactly how it works. So sometimes you need to use audio description to travel people across the thing that you're offering them to feel. You can use something similar in size and shape. This is something that my colleague Benna made for the re, for the surrealist art exhibition. It's a it's a, the work itself is a collage. It's by Arlene Nager, and so we tried to create something that was in a similar sort of a way. We'd hoped to develop that for the Rita Angus exhibition, thinking about layering things to make landscapes. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. But if anybody's already doing some of that work, I'd be really interested to hear about it. How can how can you use something like 
layers of cardboard or different sorts of material to give an indication of how landscape kind of works. We also, for that exhibition, Bella came up with now, these things are called wiki sticks, and Helen's going to hold up the wiki sticks packet. We've got a link to where they come from. This is something Mary told me about. They're a kind of waxy, soft um, thing that you can stick onto things. You can touch them and they won't stick to you. But this is Dali's moustache, nose, mouth, and the upturned moustache. It's really important always to get a sense of what your audience may or may not already know. Because not everyone knows what Dali's moustache is compared to anybody else's. It was an important part of who he was and the way he was, was described within our show. So this was a source of great entertainment to all the people who touched it and had a feeling about him. We also used the wiki sticks. Ben has used them for da da. He's a little, he's a little fish. She just made those for me, and uh, Mary's had a go with that already. Along with the audio description and being able to touch and run your hands around gives you a sense of the size of this creature and that spikiness of it. But it's safe, you know. I'm not forgetting people to put their hands in the jar with a bitey little fish. Um, it's important to think about things that support the element or the idea that you're talking to. So we have a, a part of the Te Taio exhibition where there is a seal and I'm going to be using this puppet, this rather beautiful puppet with its little bitey mouth and its whiskers, because the part of the story that I want to talk about is how behind the seal there's a straight line predator, a shark, but the seal's going to be able to twist itself and move around, move and twist. So this adds to that part of the story and people can use it to think about how that seal can manage to maneuver its way out of the line of its predator. Then something large, I might need to stand up for this. We had in a shower of gold, Gretchen Albrecht um, piece in a huge hemisphere, one of Gretchen Albrecht's huge hemispheres. When we were moving people across, the floor for that, we we walked out the length of it. We stood with our arms up above our heads and imagined we had long, long paint brushes and brought them down again. And we heard the words of, of Gretchen Albrecht herself talking about how she created this particular work. So this is a piece of canvas with oil paint on it that our conservators made for me. And it's possible to touch and sweep your hand along the different layers of paint and feel something of how that sits on the canvas and what those what those sweeping swirls might be like or what those sweeps of paint might be like the curves right up in the end she's let they've left some canvas free because that's exactly what Gretchen does as well so there's a sense of physicality that we add to all the things that we were doing and the description as well put that back down you can also hop into your local second-hand shop at any, any number of times and see if you can find things like, for example, this little kiwi. And what I'm really aware of is that the, the shape of the kiwi um, is something that people wouldn't necessarily know. If you just say a kiwi, it may be that they've never actually encountered the physicality shape of this. This has got fur on it, I think. Um, you can't always use the taxidermied specimens because they've got arsenic, I think. So you often have to come up with something else, but I can use this shape and then I do have some, some kiwi feathers that people can have, a, can have a listen to. I mean, a feel of. You can also use recorded sound. So we've used the sound of artists, we've used the voice of people making models. I've been able to use the voice of little blue penguins shrieking and shouting, or the voice of perhaps um, one of our scientists along the way. And you can use smell. So something that smells like what it is that you've got. So in terms of audio description, just a few key principles. Starting off with colour. Whenever I talk about audio description, right up people will say to me, but what about colour? How does that work? When you think about how describing colour works is interesting and useful. Uh, and when you think about what you know about colour and what your cultural, what you bring culturally to colour, it's important to understand and think about that too. But, and there's an article that will be popped up in here as well. As somebody has written about where color, how color works for people who are blind and low vision. The question is, how do you represent something that has no external reality? Something you can't touch or smell or see. 
if you think about it, it's something that happens in our, in our brains as well. So for example, if you hit the word ion or quark, I have a very vague understanding of what that means. And if you talk to physicists, they can tell you lots of mathematical descriptions, but they don't correspond with anything, not for me, that has a concrete kind of physical presence. The knowledge of something I can see will be organized in my brain, in the part of my brain that's connected with a visual system. But for color, for people who are blind, it'll be represented in area connected with, with, visual, with um, language. Sorry, just going to take a quick drink. So it'll be represented in the area that's to do with language because that's how they're experiencing it, which means we have to think very hard when we're describing colour and what the point of colour is. So, for example, <coughs> what's something that's red in front of you? What does it mean? What does it look like? Is it telling you there's danger? Is it telling you there's a warm, soft fire? Is it telling you that somebody's bleeding? And are they bleeding badly? So what is the red telling us? When I was talking to the Pukeareki team, doing some audio description training for them during the COVID lockdown, <coughs> we were talking about different colors, red, blue, yellow. Yellow said somebody, it's for emergency, it's for alert. And that was a real surprise to me because I don't ever think of yellow as being that. I think of sunshine or I think of egg yolks. But we were in that moment in the COVID lockdown where the alarm advertisements on the television and the radio or the, on the newspaper and print were yellow and yellow had a sense of alarm. So it was a very cultural moment in time that yellow we were thinking about in a different way. So we had to really think if you're talking about yellow, what is that yellow saying? You can use temperature if you're talking about color. So something that's a burning red or a cool green. You can use tone and feel like a sickly green or a sharp yellow or a drab brown. You can think about where the lighting is on your particular object. If there's flickers of light, if there's a flare of brightness, or if there's a shadow that covers somebody's face with darkness. Van Gogh apparently took piano lessons to understand the gradation of color tones and certainly music can be added to think about how do you think about describing the feel of something? When you're starting out with an object and you're going to be describing it, you need to talk about the big picture. So don't start out talking about the left leg of the Kiwi. Talk about the whole Kiwi first and then navigate people around it with language. You don't have to include every single detail. Again, it's about what's your intention? What is it that, what's the impact? What do you want people to understand about this particular thing? Think about the description as a journey and talk us around the objects in the space and how things relate to each other. So in reference to the other comments too, when you're with people, scan the horizon for things that are changing. If there's a whole group of school children about to come clustering by, make sure that the people in your group know. If there's a huge, and we have this huge clanging goods lift about to make its presence known, make sure that people know that too. Be consistent when you're talking about perspective. So let your audience know, I'm, I'm going to be talking about your left and your right, and just make sure you're always doing that. If you're looking at a, a bird, for example, you are looking. make sure you're talking about the left and right wing, make sure you understand what perspective you're talking from. Sometimes people use clock directions. So there's something over there at quarter past. I have to really think that one through. It doesn't work so well for me. So it's like about halfway across or quarter, something like that. When it comes to describing dimensions, it's really interesting to imagine what I think I'm describing by dimensions and, and what the common reference points are. So just invite you for a moment to imagine that you're holding onto a mandarin. You just hold a mandarin in one of your hands. And is it one of those very tight, tight little mandarins that you have to peel the peel off with your fingernail, or possibly even a knife or a spoon? It's probably going to be under your nails, but it's very tight, very sweet. It was one of those ones that's got puffy kind of skin. So you, you've got a, an idea of a mandarin being a reference point, but actually it's probably not as helpful as you might think. Equally bananas. So you might think it's as big as a banana, but is it one of those little bananas? Is it a longer banana? Is it curved? Is it straight? So be really intentional when you're using it's like kind of expressions. You can use things that you've experienced together. 
So you might have something you've already spoken about, such as it's longer than that seal puppet that we felt, something like that, use something that you have commonly. When we were working through the Terracotta Warriors exhibition, we carried around a bronze um, container that was about a kilo heavy. I made a mistake with that, to be honest. It would have been better to hold on to it, let people feel it, and then put it somewhere, but we carried it all the way through the exhibition. Um, but it gave people a sense of what a kilo means. What is the weight of a kilo? Because off the top of my head, how long since I held anything that was a kilo? But give people common reference points that you can continue to talk to. Things like fruit and other food are quite good. Um, common domestic objects like tea towels or tea bags, heart shapes, horseshoe shape, shape, something that's like a comb, all of those things can be useful. And because you're going to be face to face with people, be ready for them to say, don't know what you mean. You know, that's, that's an important part of the feedback that we've got. You can certainly talk about body parts higher than us. It depends who's in front of you. Of course, I did a tour once for someone who came to a couple who came, both of them had guide dogs and I knew they had guide dogs and I thought they'll be Labradors and they'll be this kind of measured up, found out how high they would be and thought about the shape of their ears and had a lot of my audio description references all set around what these dogs were going to be like, felt very well prepared. When they arrived coming towards, I saw them coming across the forecourt of the museum, had two huge fluffy Alsatians, completely different height, completely different um, feel of the ears from what I had measured. So I had to completely, I had to reassemble. So make sure you, you're being really intentional and careful with the things that you choose. You can also choose things, letters of, of the alphabet. And while we're thinking about doing it quite intentionally, remember you can have some fun with this. So when we have an exhibition called The Silverings, which is just happening here at Te Papa, just gone up, and it's in the big threshold gallery of Te Papa. And one of the wonderful facts that I've got is that the space within the threshold gallery, two stories high, is 30 million times as large as a hen's egg. So I just invite you to have some fun with this as well. Awesome, thank you, Judith. That was just amazing. I love all your objects and I definitely want to come on one of your tours. Is that okay? Is that allowed? Um, so I'm really excited to hear all of these different perspectives and all of this amazing advice um, from our different pres uh, presenters. I'm just going to scan through the chat to see if there's any um, questions for our speakers. Um, if not, as usual, I've got lots of questions of my own. So I can't see any there um, directed. Oh, yes, there is one about how do we know. Um, yeah, that's quite a good, maybe we'll start with that like how do we how will we know from teachers um if somebody is coming with um low vision or blindness and i think monica you've replied saying that's quite a good thing to ask about on your booking form at that level of interaction when you, when people are first inquiring about coming is to specifically ask if there are any um students that we need to be aware of any um disability that we can assist them with um, but that sort of leads me on to a question that I have for um, Lee and Tracy um, which is you know what different types of support can educators in culture and heritage settings access if they know they've got a blind um, or low vision student visiting them? Um, yeah that's a good question I, I think that there's a few different places obviously if they are connected to a school. Um, one of the places would be is to ask the school whether they um, there is a resource teacher vision who supports, um, because that would be a wealth of information that you can have come into your hands. Um, obviously, your local blends office, you could always give them a ring um, and see if there's some particular questions that they could chat through with you about. Um, we're, I think, we're a pretty friendly bunch, aren't we, Tracy? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> if you have um, your own iPads, mm -hmm. you could consider whether you could uh, look at the accessibility features within those iPads that you have on site, um, make the print size bigger, make the contrast better, just go into those accessibility features um, and you'll see that there's quite a few that you can adjust um, to make better. Um, obviously, on the, your chat session, but also in our presentation, we've indicated some good go-to sites such as the Blends, Blind Low Vision. 
um, Helberg uh, blind sport if you're being pretty active. Um, and obviously Google, like there are some really good Google sites from places overseas. Um, Texas School for the Blind is a very good site as a wealth of information. So here, just doing a good search online to get some information can be useful too. Thank you. So we've just had another question pop up in the chat. Um, we have a group that comes, a uh, group of students that come with hearing issues and they get together from different schools in Canterbury. Um, and the question is, does this happen um, in a similar way for people um, with visual impairment or blindness? In Wellington, we have um, probably perhaps twice a year, we try and get a group of students together. Um, and we might go to the ballet um, or we might go to Papa. Papa often provides services for us. Um, it's just a chance for students with the same disabilities to actually get together and to meet and to be social. Yeah. Awesome, that sounds great. And oh, Monica, thank you. You've just put that um, link into the Texas School for the um, Blind and Visually Impaired. Well done. So this chat is full of resource links. Um, and oh, we've had a lovely comment there. Someone else wants to join one of your tours. So um, kia ora. just to respond to that, one of the things about the tours that we take is that they are private tours sometimes therefore a group that come in together or or we'll let people know about it publicly but they're a conversation and they're not a performance if you like I think we started out by saying to people yes come along but I increasingly understand we need people to be part of it it's we want them to be part of the experience so it is possible for people to come along if I need a hand sometimes and actually be part of it so maybe you might be doing the kind of sighted guiding that was in the um, PowerPoint, or you might be helping making the tea afterwards. So yes, it's certainly possible, but I think where we where you might think about a tour as me standing up and talking at people, what we're doing is creating a, a moment in time where we can share ideas and, and have a rich experience together. Um, so yes, happy to think about it. It's also not impossible to come up with the idea if there were enough people, say, in Wellington, to do a kind of walk through idea of a touch tour but it's not the same as as being part of one but i'm certainly open to people getting in touch with me if that's something that interests them well that's very generous thank you i think we've just set ourselves up with some um training thanks, thanks for that Judith. <laughs> um so let's just see if there's another and um, so i've got um a question for you mary um i was really touched when you were talking about your childhood experience and um being in that environment with your classmates and thinking I can't see what they're talking about I you know and sort of but not wanting to draw attention to yourself which I, yeah I really relate to that and I just feel like that must yeah must be quite a difficult experience um so I guess what I want to know from you is like if there's one thing that may would make that experience better for you what would you what would you say that is I think one thing is tricky to come up with but it is a bit dependent on the age and developmental stage of the child, but really doing a little bit of work beforehand can make a big difference on the day or in how a student thinks about their experience afterwards is the is the one kind of thing I'd say. Um, and I was thinking of this this one time when I was a new entrant, it was one of my like burnt into my brain memories, where we we're all sitting on the mat and I was sitting at the front like I'd obviously been placed there, but um, but the teacher was drawing big letters on an easel and I just like, I could see her hand moving and I could hear all my friends around being like, oh, it's a B or whatever letter it was, but I just could not see what was on the easel and I was getting very confused. And then, um, because I think as a five-year-old, I had slightly more confidence than as a nine-year-old and you're starting to feel more self-conscious. But as a five-year-old, I was like, oh, I can't, why can't I? I can't see the letters. And then just without making a big scene or anything, the teacher changed from a pencil to like a vivid. And then suddenly I could see it, um, the letters coming up just magically. Mm -hmm. um, but it, like that was obviously a good thing because the student had the self-confidence to say, hey, this isn't working for me. I don't think I think I'd have a different experience than everyone else. And the teacher just really could change to something that might make a difference. And it did, and it was really great. 
um, that having like a little bit of forethought and talking to either the RTV or, the, or giving the student a call or a text of asking what their access needs are, their lighting and glare or their having like electronic files beforehand or a braille copy of whatever the day will entail. So yeah, I think just really communicating with the student or the people around that student who know their needs yeah. beforehand. Nice, thank you. Um, so we've sort of already touched on something I was going to ask you about, Judith, is where people can go to get training for audio description. <laughs> you can hear Mary laughing. Um, audio description, even overseas, there's, and certainly in New Zealand, there's no um, formal training. There's no, like, qualification that you would get. Um, what I would suggest, and, and while I did do some training to begin with, um, is start to listen to audio description. So there's a link there somewhere which is about homegrown audio description and you'll find audio descriptions from people like Pukiariki who have put some in place. Um, I think City Galleries is still perhaps not online, but listen to audio descriptions that other people have done and listen out to some overseas. If you want to listen to more, I'm happy to send people some links. British Museum has a huge range of audio descriptions online. So there's plenty that you can listen to and start to tune your mind into how you might be more effective in sharing that visual information verbally. But I can't stress enough, I guess, how important it is to start to talk to your community and ask what they want and what would be useful for them as well. So one of the things that interested me when we did that pilot was we brought in a group of people and we were talking about the whole toy art hang and um, we had gone through and kind of triaged maybe seven or eight works that would create an interesting narrative, different sorts of works. And, and one of the people who came said, but why can't you do all the artworks? And that sense that somebody simply hadn't been in the gallery at all. So there were things that were already getting in the way of them even coming to the gallery before we started. So that was adults. But listen out to a lot of stuff. Um, it's possible to do audio description training with me through national services if you make a request. Uh, it seems to work okay on um, Zoom and if you can do it with some people that you know so that you can test and try and build a, I'm, my idea is a community of practice here in Aotearoa, especially in the glam sector because we're, we're often kind of isolated, but how can we help and support each other? There's a Facebook group which I am, I contribute to a lot called Christchurch Audio Describers Network. If you want to join that, probably best to flip me an email first and then I'll know who you are. But I put in lots of things that I can think of that are that are sharing ideas. So if you if you do want to do some training, let me know. Um, there's nothing particularly planned and nobody particularly owns it. There's also Audio Scribe Arthur in Auckland who do training for people. I think the people from Auckland Museum perhaps mentioned the other day they've done some with Nicola Owen. So it's certainly possible, but start listening, learning. If you can turn on your television channel to the audio description for um, various uh, television one, television two, television three as an option, put it, if you're looking at a DVD, turn on the audio description option, start to think in a slightly different way, put on a slightly different hat and say, I can see that. How, how can I describe that? So st start thinking through some of those things as well as a way of, of, of as a commencement anyway, but get in touch if you need to know anything from me. Thank you. I have to say that I really enjoyed listening to your audio description. So I'm a um, secondary art teacher by training and have worked at Papa as an educator, particularly up in the and as I was listening to your audio description, I really enjoyed that sensation, that experience. And I wanted to just sit with my eyes closed and let my imagination build the picture for me. And I started to think that actually audio description and the way that you were um, using it could be useful for all kinds of different activities in the mm. gallery um, beyond um, making things more accessible for people with low vision or blindness. And, um, you know, I was thinking that perhaps we could you know, do drawing to audio description or, um, yeah, think about um, getting students to, to look carefully at things and describe them to other students and building their descriptive language. Visual literacy, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, it could be useful for all kinds of things. Oh, Monica's obviously got her eye on the clock and realised that it's nearly time for us to say goodbye. So, um, 
I want to say thank you to all of our speakers today. Thank you, um, Miri. Thank you, Duda. Um, thank you, Tracy. And thank you, Lee. Um, so before we close with our karakia, um, I just want to let you know what's happening next week. So on next Thursday, the 9th of June, at our usual time, 3.30 to 4.30, um, we have got Melissa and AJ from Zealandia Eco Sanctuary talking about um, the way that they teach outdoors and the benefits of teaching out in nature. So it's a really nice follow on from um, Tali's um, webinar just recently. And they'll be also talking about some of the training and protocols that they um, use in the uh, place of work so tune in this time next week for that one it's been really lovely having everybody here today thank you for all your lovely um comments and thanks in the chat i'll be passing those on to the speakers afterwards if they haven't seen them yet and we'll close with a karakia unuhia 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 ki te uru tapu nui kia wātia kia mama Tinako, Titinana, Tiwairua, Iti Arutakata, Koyara Irongo, Pakeriria, Ake Kirunga, Kia Tina, Tina, Huye Tai Kie. Thank you, everybody. Matiwa.